Hey everyone, this is Jeanette Barnard with Prime Future, and I'm excited today to be joined by someone that I have followed on Twitter for a while, Jason Mock. Jason, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for uh, having me, Jeanette. Okay, so let's start here. So the reason that I found you is that you write a lot of non-traditional things about agriculture. You take some contrarian viewpoints. So tell us about what you do, what's your, what, what's your role in ag, and uh, what are some of those non-traditional thoughts that you have? So I guess what, what I do or what I'm most responsible for is managing a family farm uh, that I came to because I lost my father in, in 2010, 2011. And uh, so that's kind of my day job, but um, sort of get really bored with it. And that's kind of what the content that you've seen is, is me kind of experimenting the last few years and meeting people. And, and it's kind of led to attracting uh, people that I've been able to put in positions to, to thrive. That's kind of my goal here. But uh, the reason why I'm different is because of my experience in that losing my father, my background was being a landscape contractor in sales. And, um, and I had another <laughs> issue years as years passed losing another uncle. So I'm, I am, uh, I am uh, maybe a little bit different than most seeing that uh, I see risks as actually a safety net and most people see risk as, uh, as something they fear, uh, but the, the, the past experiences kind of led us to where we are today, the things we can talk about. Awesome, okay, can you, first of all, can you explain that, um, that you see risk as a safety net, how so? Well, um, <laughs> you know, it, just, 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 you know, if you run a really go back, I think it starts when you're in sports, when you're little, right? So. When you pitch, you threw as hard as you could and you started making strikes and, and, and then you played sports and you figured out that if you, if you think you're going to miss it before you shoot it, then you're probably going to miss it. And you, you start putting together this idea of, of when you really were successful is when you had confidence. And I think, I think part of, of, of this progression in life is, is, is building this self-confidence, which only happens when you take risks. Um, so I think when I came to farming, while it was weird, it was a, I was always an entrepreneur from when I was 10, I, I started the sweet corn stand and then I was in sales or I was a commission and I was a, an entrepreneur. So this idea of, of going to a farm where we have these guaranteed outcomes and, you know, we have these APHs and we're just like, well, this is what we do is we just grow corn and we're guaranteed this. And then it's just like, it was so it, not only boring, but it was so unfulfilling. Um, so I, I, I needed a challenge. I needed, uh, I needed this, uh, something that could go wrong. Um, and then once you start doing that, then, then, then this, people call it failure. Uh, but, but the failure is really how you learn and, and how you can change from year to year. So it, it was just a progression of, of mistakes. Love it. Um, I think George Washington would agree with you. I'm just finishing a biography about him and he was of course, quite the, uh, agriculture experimenter, um, as a planter. So, I think you would uh, share some of that perspective. So talk to us, what are some of the, what are a few hypotheses that you've had that you've tested that maybe worked, maybe didn't work? Well, I think, I think in general, what has changed in my mindset is just people would ask when I first started intercropping, you know, what is your end game? And I never, I never had an answer to that. You know, it was just the beginning of, of asking why we do something and, and what, what are the possibilities? And I think in the past five years, my mindset has went from this feed the world, you know, just you just make a bigger pile than the next guy and this competition compete mindset to create, attract and uh, see what the possibilities are. And in kind of uh, simplicity, right? So I, I, I was just seeing something this morning and I won't get into the whole political spectrum of weeds here, but this lady was talking about a vaccine and if we can come up with a vaccine in three months, why can't we figure out how to uh, have food in these urban areas, these food deserts? Like, why is that not why, what we're putting our, our mind space in? And I think that's, I think that's important where we're all out here making all this food, but where's it going? You know, what's the total cost of that food production? How can we make it simple? And when you start experimenting and learning and attracting people and they share their ideas, the, uh, the options and possibilities, I think, uh, start to express themselves. And I think, I think the goal now is to 
you know, just connect and integrate the community and, and make this so much more simple than, you know, I grow 242 bushel corn, I take it to this feed mill, it goes overseas, it makes ethanol. Like, do we need to, <laughs> do we need to take a whole state of Iowa and grow corn? You know, why are we taking this most valuable resources and just um, feeding the system? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So let's transition that then. How, how did that get you into the meat business? Well, going, but I, I think that's the, you know, I can't serve you. If I serve you number two corn, you put milk on it, you know, I don't you're, buy much of it. Right. <laughs> it's not that great. So, you know, meat seemed like the, uh, what made sense there. And, uh, there was a big problem when, when the coronavirus came about, the uh, shelves became empty, the price of meat went up. But if you looked on the Chicago Board of Trade, it was probably the lowest points that it's ever been. So there's this huge imbalance here. And why is that? And that's because of this uh, you know, centralization that we created uh, in the entire food model. So we, we saw this opportunity, we called around, we found a guy that uh, you know, if you, if you watch, uh, kind of watch the business world, like Red Robin restaurants, they only put them around malls. Well, that's a problem when you're one dimensional. And this uh, Muncie Meats had a legacy model of serving restaurants. Well, when coronavirus happened, it wasn't good to be one dimensional. So it was just a red ink business model that we saw cold storage infrastructure. Uh, we, we had people in place that we could put in there and uh, we're completely changing what we do with the assets in place here. So what, what is the vision? Expand on that a little bit more for us of, as you look so at Muncie it Meats. Was 100% serving restaurants, uh, mostly getting big box meats in from Car Cargill and, and uh, cutting them up. And you know, uh, on the side of the trucks was portion control meat USDA facility. And we we're gonna wean that from say 80, 20 to 20, 80. Uh, direct consumer in the years to come. Um, the restaurant industry is just like if I want to go out and rent a bunch of cash rented ground, you know, I got to pay $375 to get land. If I want to go down to Hamilton County where I look cool and I'm say I'm a purveyor of this awesome restaurant, well, it's a dog eat dog, red ocean co competition uh, world there. Uh, we can leverage the scale in the kind of legacy con connections that we have and the trucks and the cold storage to transition into where there is more margins, but also more opportunity, what we envision in the future, which is where people want to know their farmer. They're not so concerned about the label. They want to know the farmer. They want to see it. They want to see the entire um, process. And, uh, and then we can start tackling some of these bigger problems, issues of getting nice clean protein and, and fruits and vegetables to some of these areas of the country that aren't serviced now. It's really interesting because most producers that are trying to follow a similar path of get closer to the consumer, margin up on what they're selling, um, they run into the two issues, one of bottleneck around processing capacity and two, logistics. Mm -hmm. And where you purchase Munzee Meats, you've kind of, you, you've bought both of those capabilities. So now your challenge is how do you build the brand with consumers? So how do you approach that, that challenge? So you get started. And that, that's part of the thing I had with experimentation is, is, is not being so concerned about scale right away. I try to, try to get as many experiments as possible. So you condense, you know, 10 experiments on an acre and you can do that times 100. And the risk yeah. isn't that... Uh, that great. So the first thing that we did the first week was we went to Rural King and we bought a bunch of shelvings and we turned a truck that normally would take sausage to a pizza place and we turned it into a direct consumer come out. And we, we strategically knew we were going to buy Muncie Meats in uh, March and April. We didn't close to July. So we put some venues in place knowing that this is what we were going to do. So we took a five acre patch and grew, we had rye in there, we grew sweet corn and pumpkins. So we put the truck where they could pick their own sweet corn, say, come back and get pumpkins. And we had, uh, you know, these different farms that had chickens that we could market. And we kind of created this farm knowing that we we're going to have this asset. So we simply went to Rural King and spent about $1,500 and turned it into a, a meat truck. It wasn't the prettiest meat truck, but we could put 50 different items come out there. And it was something that 
the people had never really experienced this this uh, coming you know out to the public and and uh, with open arms. Oh, I love it. So, I mean, the two things that I hear you saying, one is just get started. And then two is finding ways to experiment in a way that lets you learn, but doesn't, if it, if it doesn't work, you get to take that as a learning. It doesn't stop the whole business. I mean, I think yeah. that, that those are two really important fundamental things that I hear you saying there that we need more of that in ag. Tell me, so you describe, you describe this truck that you spent $1,500 on, uh, the, the remodel here, the trailer. Um, I've seen this on Twitter. Describe it in a little bit more detail of what's unique about it. There's nothing unique about it. We just painted the axles and put some shelves in there and, okay. and, uh, and just invited them out. So it's nothing unique. Now, now what we've done from, from this summer uh, some of the uh, relationships, how they built, we built them, our new AFM, the way we're going to deliver a retail space, like, like all this stuff took time and you had to kind of create, you had to get, like I said, you had to get started. So, you know, if you sold $5,000 for the me, that's not a huge deal in the, in the relation of all the bills we have to pay, but everything I, I, I get into the math, right? The phi is, is just like a corn swirl. If I take it apart, you know, the, mm -hmm. the tassel is created when the corn's knee high. So everything in nature is a lag. So we've got to create the first customers and make them happy to create the next customers. So that, that, that was a big part of getting started is, is just not spending money. And another thing that really bothers me, um, there's two things, right? So uh, people don't really appreciate small scale experimentation at first, but they don't understand what can come about of it. And also there's this thought of if everyone did that, then this, well, not everyone's ever going to do it mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the resistance. So you create, uh, I, I saw a quote this morning that said, if you go up to a uh, thistle and you gingerly grab it, then it's going to prickle you. But if you can firmly grab it, then you just break all the thistle mm -hmm. and it's just squishy, right? So uh, it's this creation of, of calluses through the self confidence experimentation that allows this swirl to start. And there's no reason where if, if two people are deployed to a truck, uh, you can have multiple swirls, multiple ideas go on. And if this crashes and burns, guess what? You've got all these other things going on. Absolutely. Well, and it's, it, I love that point of there's so many people that say if everyone did that, then there wouldn't be any value in it. But it's so true. Not everyone is going to be willing to do the hard things to go build a consumer brand, to go buy a meat processing plant. I mean, there's a lot of people that have talked about that in 2020, very few people that have taken meaningful action towards it. So yes. um, I, I would 100% agree with that. Okay, so now I got to ask. So I saw the, I guess the, the trailer that I'm thinking of on Twitter, I don't know if it was yours or if you guys were looking at it, um, mm -hmm. but it was where it had like individual lockers. Okay, where Consumers yeah, that's... could come and pick up yeah, that's so that's our automated farmers market. And tell us yeah, about that. So we put it, we just installed it about two weeks ago, and we're just getting all the bugs out now. We've got an e commerce platform, uh, kind of like Gray's Cart, but it'll be uh, more items. And basically, how it works is let me let me start at the beginning with this. Um, okay. When I was a landscaper, Right, a lot of people would put their number on the side of the truck and spend money in the uh, yellow pages and just basically take on whatever people call you. So now you're picking up walnuts and you're going here and there. And what I learned as a sales professional is the self-confidence to go into the place that I actually wanna do business with and close that, knowing that there's so much value in it being right next to it or it's been a highway or it's a nice place or it's, and, I, I'm always looking for this ball in hand uh, ways that I can actually uh, play the math out. Once I make a sale or, or kind of put my battleship in a yeah. place, there's, there's a lot of value that can go on from there. So the AFM, the, the whole value of this is I can be a ninja, meaning this. So where do I want to have the ability to do commerce to sell meat and farmers products? where everyone goes to get their, their, their food anyway. So this kiosk is non-invasive. So we, we found a motorcycle dealership that is right at the entrance of where all the middle and upper class demographic get their food. 
And we ask this, how much value are you getting out of this caddy corner parking lot right here? Nothing. So how would you like to have a non-invasive kiosk here that we will share 2% uh, of the revenue towards for the commerce that we have and we'll just write you a check at end of month. We can promote each other. Um, they love that. So <laughs> by being able to do that, not only do we, it's location, 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 can we intercept people and, and put up on the billboard, skip the counter, you know, don't spend 20 minutes, spend 20 seconds here and create that swirl there. But now once this becomes a success, I can go anywhere. And now if I can go anywhere and get this to work, now I can start working with, with the, the local farmers and, and we, we create or we, we, we get rid of all these middlemen that, that have their hand out in the process. Absolutely. And so if I'm a consumer, if I, and if I, am I purchasing on your e-commerce site and then picking it up at the automated farmer's market? Is that how this works? Yes. So you probably can't see my phone well, but if I get on MuncieMeats.com, yeah. I hit consumer and then I hit uh, online cart and then I can buy seven ribeyes and a dozen eggs and cheese and honey from this guy. And then we basically take your order and we'll take it to uh, the kiosk with 10 or 20 other orders. And uh, we put a little QR code on our little thing. We, we um, put it in the system. If we want it, you know, at five degrees or 35 degrees, we put it in there. And as soon as we put it in there and say his is in there, then it sends a code to that customer's phone. So that customer gets an email and a text, both with a QR code. They'll hit that right when they show up. So if I'm up to the camera, my QR code gets snapped. Mm -hmm. That door opens with their order. But the beautiful thing is we can put it in the caddy corner part of the parking lot where they can literally pull up right up to the kiosk, get out of their car with their kids in the car or their grandma or anything else on their way to somewhere else and literally get out and back in in 10 seconds. So you, you know, I think a lot of people in this industrial uh, reductionist mind look at something like Airbnb or Uber or stuff like that and they say, well, you know, I'll just do this, but it's not the ride, the Uber. Right. It's the insurance, it's the gas, it's when it's pouring down That's rain right. and you don't pay $20 to park and waddle through the rain and the puddles for 15 minutes. It's, it's all the BS that you can boil out. And I think this is what ag needs is the BS out, it's the farmer and it's consumer and it's putting in a place where it's convenient. And what the problem with farmer's markets, it's great, it's great to do a Saturday acquaint, but most people want convenience. Right. So what I, what I hear you saying, so for, so for me coming from the last several years, um, more on the tech side of the industry, right? What I hear you saying is a focus on customer experience. Again, not something we hear that often in agriculture. What we hear in agriculture is consumers need to go get educated about what I do, right? That's what we often hear. What I hear you saying is, I'm going to figure out how to get my product to the customer in the, the way that's the, the most effective for them um, yeah. it, under the assumption that's going to be what grows the business. That's what grows margin, market share, all of the above. I mean, I think that's a completely different script going on in your head than a lot of people's heads. Yes, exactly. We were like... We've spent years and years and years of optimization to figure out exactly how to yeah. gain the most pounds and the most yield. And this is what we do now. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, the, the thing is, is if you can wait how important things are and you figure out that customer experience and convenience is most important. You know, I can be bad at golf or bad at sex, but both are extremely, <laughs> both can be enjoyable even if you're bad at it. So it doesn't like put a gun to your head. The other thought of farming, like if I can't raise exactly as good a corn as this other guy, then I can't compete and pay the most cash rent. And we like get it down to the bottom line. And we're like, well, okay, even though we're losing $30 here, grandpa bought a farm in 1947 and we can bog this equity in here and buy that new tractor. And it's just this not rational thought at all. And <laughs> this, the value we create by, uh, creating this new customer experiences, we, we can, we don't have to have all the answers up front. We just have to, uh, you know, find a way to get it done. 
Right, man, say, say that louder for the people in the back. So what has the reaction been of, from your customers to the automated farmer's market? How, how has that been received by your customer base? Well, we haven't really unveiled it oh, okay. fully yet. Now we've had close friends do it. So, you know, it's just like uh, Zach Smith. He's on my first podcast because I knew I would be bad at it and we could do it a couple of times and it'd be fine. So I'm inviting friends and family to experience it, to get all the bugs out. And they think it's the coolest thing ever. So we've got that just about ready to go. And I think it's just going to sell itself. Yeah. So there's, there's not much nervous tension about it. We're going to get, um, you know, we're getting free publicity, if you will, when people start using it. And then um, I can put out content exactly how it works. Absolutely. I'm pretty confident it's just going to work. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking time to talk about this. Again, I think I think what you're doing with the meat business is really interesting and really timely here in 2020. Um, but even more so, I mean, I think the approach you're taking and the mentality is um, going to lead you to, to some really interesting outcomes. So I'm excited to follow uh, where this leads. Good. Could I mention one more thing, Jeanette, Absolutely. that I, I wanted to hit that I think is going to really drive uh, our our footprint with the consumers. Um, so we brought on uh, Nick Terry about two months ago uh, from Cisco and, and we were kind of toying around with this fundraising idea and he's really taken it. And I've had a, I have a couple friends that are our principals in uh, high schools. Uh, so we started doing uh, fundraising uh, just in the past uh, six weeks. And this is gonna be a way when you look at our entire flow of business um, I know this is, you didn't really ask this question, but I, I, it's something I'm really excited about. So uh, when we take something like a, a cow from a farmer, you know, everyone wants the steaks and the ribeyes and there's value in the hamburger, but you got to create these outflows. Another little tangent here is I'm a weather guru. From, uh, I like to look at hurricanes and they have to be under high pressure and have the right spice symmetry. They got to have outflow and inflow, warm water and all that stuff. So Fundraisers allow us to give our quality product to, in as many homes as possible. We went to a school that graduates 39 people in the senior class, and we got 400 some people to take in our product. We put quality product in there, we put hamburger, the hamburger can't move to get to the good sticks yeah. to get added value. But this also creates uh, these warm leads and uh, when I was a sales professional, I, I basically went broke. And I, I like to share this story because it, it, I think it made me who I am on a business sense. Um, when I was 23 years old, I was a year and a half out of college. I went into college with quite a bit in my checking account because I sold sweet corn and 4-H animals, but I like to go on road trips and bars and chase whatever. And I eventually got to this low point and I was going on leads, uh, which a company would generate at county fairs, and you would drive two hours and they wouldn't show up. And you would basically waste your day. And I would always sell the company that said we have 50,000 customers. And I didn't have an option because I was completely out of cash and I couldn't even spend any money in the gas to get to the next place. So all I did was I started knocking on doors of people that we've done work for in the past. And what I found out was that I was always hitting rubber to the road. I was always in front of people that not only uh, liked our company, but they've made a purchase in the past. And my sales went up exponentially. And I did that for about six weeks until the people in the company, I was calling on their past customers, they got mad, but they weren't gonna do that. And it gave me the confidence to go out and be, uh, start a landscape business and, and sell and to people on paper on where I wanted to be. But the idea here is this, is whether you're relay cropping, collecting sunlight, connect with the community, commerce centers, whatever, you've got to figure out what is actually driving value uh, to your business and always keep that rubber on the road. So if we can have these fundraisers where we're working, giving money back to the, uh, the schools, but we're putting our product in all these homes and we're creating all these people that have Muncie meats in the refrigerator that we can go back and just simply ask, how was it? And how much money do you have to burn through to be able to intersect that many people? And at least, and, and at that point, you're just trying to get them to try. Right. But if you can figure out ways 
to get people to work with you. It's a beautiful thing. So that's why I put things, I spend five or 10 minutes, put something out on Twitter, you know, whatever. It's not like I'm sitting here worried about what people, you, you got to have all these different things going on and keep the rubber to the road. So. Right. Well, and that one's really, the fundraising is an interesting avenue since that gives you both an operational benefit <laughs> as well as the sales and the lead gen benefit as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it just more, I just hear more business model um, innovation than anything as you, as you talk through how you guys are approaching that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, this, I'm excited, you know, there's one other component in all this is, is we really want to find these people that stayed in the community. You know, Gaston is now 800 people. It was probably 1,200 in the 80s. Um, you know, the Dollar General comes in to the outside of town. It's not like the Dollar Generals are bad, but then they compete with the mom and pop guy that's been there. And nobody buys uh, their food there at the mom and pop place anymore. So we're, we're, we're getting our footprint in, in a lot of these local convenience stores where we have the farmers meet and they know where that meat came from, the farmer, and a portion of that goes to the farmer, a portion goes to the school, and a portion of it goes back to the community. I think we have to think about where all this goes. And, and that's that's just what I want to lead you with. I think I think if you take anything from this, is we're so concerned about production, but we just gotta we gotta figure out where it goes, how it stays, how it sticks, and how it rebuilds. Excellent. That's a great note to end on. Thanks so much for joining us, Jason. Thank you.